at the, at, at the moment. So, so Thea first of all started off doing uh, geology, uh, did her degree uh, in geology in Oviedo as well. So uh, I guess that you may have been taught uh, Lithia by, by one of our old postdocs uh, in the department here, um, yeah, Sergio uh, Yanofonis at some point maybe. Um, and also you'll be familiar with uh, a lot of the field sites that we go on on the basins to mountains field class uh, or have done in previous years, not the last one obviously, uh, but uh, many happy memories of, uh, of uh, uh, the great geology in Northwest Spain that I guess that you trained on uh, there as well. Yeah. So um, after finishing a, a, a bachelor's, uh, Lithia uh, moved to Royal Holloway uh, and to complete her PhD there. Uh, and then from there, uh, conducted uh, postdoctoral work at both Royal Holloway and uh, Oxford. And uh, I think very recently she's uh, been employed by, uh, is it Nexon? Yeah, ne no, sorry, ne Neftex, who were uh, bought out by Halliburton and uh, um, is employed by them at the moment. Okay, so I will uh, pass on to this here and uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'd all like to, to welcome her in the uh, seminar today, which is on plate tectonics, mantle plumes, and the importance of keeping good time. Thanks. Um, thanks for the invitation, uh, first of all. Um, so, yeah, um, I should, before I forget, because uh, people always get a bit confused with my affiliation. So, yeah, I moved uh, to NAFTAX about a year ago now. I'm still an associate at Oxford, and this piece of work was done at Oxford, so I should credit them. Um, and um, my colleague, Scrim Eagles, from the Alfred Wagner Institute, and Karen Sikloch, who was uh, at Oxford at the time. Um, so I was saying to Caitlin that uh, probably won't take the whole hour. This project was one of those that took quite a long time. It was in the pipeline for a long time. It was like in the back of my head. And it took a few years to actually get somewhere, but when it eventually did and it became a paper, it's a nice, very short paper and it's a short project that you can explain quite quickly, which is probably why it's my favorite project that I've worked on, because I feel like it's packaged very neatly. Um, but let's see if you agree. I'm gonna be looking over here because that's where my slides are, my camera's there. But, um, so, Something that um, has always fascinated me, at least since I started getting more into plate modeling, um, sort of towards the end of my master's and the beginning of my PhD, is the sort of unresolved or only partly answered question that we still have about what actually moves plate tectonics. How did plate tectonics start? What keeps it going? What are the forces? Uh, how do they evolve over time? Have they changed over time? And all of these things. Some people will say, oh, no, we know a lot today um, compared to 50 years ago. But actually, there's a lot we still don't know. Um, this is a wonderful illustration from a paper from the 70s that every time I look at, I, I, I wish today we could um, produce our paper figures by just hand drawing them because I uh, like uh, drawing and, and illustrating. So um, it's a paper called Problems of Plumacy. And it's really wonderful. It's a great sort of weekend read. Um, it's very funny and witty. Um, but today we think we know that in the plate tectonic world, subduction kind of rules all, over all of the other forces. So it's not just that subduction zones and the forces that are generated along subduction zones um, are the main forces moving the plates today, but we also think that it's possible that subduction is uh, the reason that plate tectonics started on Earth in the first place as well. Now, if this is true, if plates really do move uh, predominantly as a result of the forces related to subduction, then we shouldn't expect that any plate at any time um, would move any faster than the rate at which slabs sink into the mantle. But we see times when this happens. So because we see times when this happens and we see times when plates are much faster, are moving much faster than the rate at which slabs are sinking, there have been other theories coming up to explain these fast motions. And the most famous um, example is the example of the Indian plate. Um, this is, uh, by the way, another illustration from that same paper. This is the last one. I will not show you all of them. Um, 
So the Indian plate had over a period of time going sort of between 65 and 60 million years ago, it really speeds up. So it's moving northwards on its way uh, to eventually collide with Eurasia. But over this short period, it really speeds up. It speeds up by over 200%. And so there were a number of papers um, a few years ago, and they still, still recently actually, suggesting that because the reunion plume is reaching the base of the lithosphere at about the same time as the Indian plate is accelerating, maybe the plume has something to do with it. And so this hypothesis came about, and it's called plume push hypothesis, that suggests that, you know, we can just blame the plume. It's the plume. The plume caused that acceleration. Now, some of these papers gained a lot of traction, and we started seeing a trend whereby um, researchers would find some sort of event that a tectonic event that they can't quite explain, but if there is a plume nearby, well, it must be the plume. It's quite convenient, it's quite handy. Um, but this is why I was saying earlier that you know, in the back of my head, I had thought about this when some of these papers came out. It was the same for Graham, he had already, we had talked about it. Um, and eventually we thought, okay, let's actually look into it. So the in the Indian, uh, plate case study, that's a little very crude reconstruction of the plates in this uh, little Indian plate circuit. Um, you have three spreading ridges, you have three plates here, Africa, India, and Antarctica. And essentially the plume comes up kind of under the India Africa ridge, so the black one here. And these are the two main papers that proposed that the coincidence both in time and in space of the arrival of the plume and the acceleration of India uh, must mean that they are related events. So the hypothesis goes a little bit like this. The plume arrives, India speeds up, Africa slows down. And so we have all of these changes across the, across the entire plate circuit that we can attribute to plume push forces. In a cross section, some people find it a bit easier to kind of visualize. It looks a bit like this. We'd have the India-Africa um, spreading ridge over here. Africa and India are both moving in the same direction at this time, but India is moving faster. So that's why we have divergence here. Sometimes, um, depending on your specialism, you might be thinking, well, if there's divergence, the plates are moving away from each other. They, they don't have to, they can be moving towards the same direction, but at different speeds. The plume arrives, it causes doming of the lithosphere and those plume push forces are favoring the motion of India, but they are going against the motion of Africa. So that's why India is accelerating and Africa is slowing down, or that's hypothesis. So how did this hypothesis even came about? And you know, the, I keep talking about the acceleration of India. How do we know that India accelerated? We observed, or I, I don't know why I say we, I was a student, I had nothing to do with it. Um, some of these authors that, uh, that authored these studies I was referring to, looked at plate models. And some of you may have no idea how plate models are constructed. So I'll just very quickly go over some of the very basic ideas um, so that you can follow me as I move along. But essentially, when we have oceanic lithosphere, when we're modeling an area where we still have oceanic lithosphere today and we haven't lost it to subduction or anything like that, the main source of information are magnetic anomalies. So these stripes that you see, you know, if you pick up the geological time scale, has that um, geochronological time scale at the side. So you tow a magnetometer across the oceans, you record magnetic anomalies, and then you interpret them. You correlate them to an ideal magnetic anomaly curve that you already know. And you essentially plot little dots. And for all of those dots, you know how old those points are. So it's a way to, um, you can see here, there's lots and lots of them. So for all of these, they come from interpreted magnetic anomalies and they're telling us how old these different places in the ocean are. They all have names uh, that start mostly with C uh, for this period of time, um, because they're crons. And um, this process that I show here kind of in a very simplified way, where essentially you're, we're looking at acquired magnetic data and we're correlating it with an ideal curve, and it looks pretty straightforward, 
and reality is a bit more complex and the raw data can look quite unwieldy. Um, as I found out when I started this project because I had never actually gone back to the raw data and interpreted it myself. So quantitative plate models use this type of data. So essentially what these magnetic picks are marking is the position of the mid-ocean ridge back in time. So the positions of paleo mid-ocean ridges. Plate modelers also use other features, namely fractures on traces, which you can see here in blue. They also help us because they're telling us about the directions of plate motion. So those are two main sources of information for modeling uh, plate motions. And it was through one of these or several of these models that that acceleration of India was picked up. Now, when we started looking at this, we noticed that the, in the South Atlantic, we had no data for the period between C25 and C30 or 29. There are no picks at all, which means that when we're producing a plate model, if we're producing a plate model for this part of the world, we can say where South America and Africa were at C24, and we can say where they were at C30, but because there's no picks in between, the movements of the plates between those two points are just gonna be averaged uh, or rather interpolated. So we're gonna assume that spreading rates were even um, throughout this period, and you know, that's that. And that's quite common, and it's, it's not necessarily a problem. But these crons are located in time exactly when the reunion plume is arriving. So if we want to use plate models to say something about how plates were moving, whether they moved any differently because of the arrival of the plume or not, we need more resolution. Essentially, what we need is just to increase the resolution. And this is why I had the lovely task of going back into the raw data again, plotting it all and um, getting more picks. And that is, that was an interesting exercise because that is freely available data. And I thought it was unlikely that I would find very much. I thought, well, if we don't have picks for this period of time, probably it's because it's really hard to interpret and nobody's been able to make these picks. But I was able to make almost 400 more. So it, since then, I, whenever I'm working on a different part of the world, I'm always like, hmm, maybe I should have a look at the raw data, because it seems we get into the habit of just reusing what other people have interpreted, rather than actually go and have a look ourselves again. And it clearly can be quite fruitful. Now, you might be wondering, wait, what are you doing in the South Atlantic, um, where we're not talking about the Indian Ocean? And yes, we were talking about the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm going to skip the next slide. Um, but the thing is, we're talking about the Indian Ocean and we're talking about mainly two things, we're talking about India accelerating and also we're talking about Africa slowing down, um, which, as I explained, is because the supposed push force of the plume would have opposed the motion of Africa, the direction of motion, so it would have slowed down Africa. And so really... Uh, because plates are all connected to other plates. If Africa is slowing down and India is accelerating, yes, I should see changes in the Indian Ocean, but I should also see changes in the South Atlantic because Africa is right dead in the middle. So it's whatever Africa is doing and the changes in Africa's motion are going to affect all the system of bridges around, around Africa. And this is not new, this is not something that we've done that previous authors didn't do. They also looked at the South Atlantic, but when they did their study, the play model that they used in the South Atlantic was missing that part of data. So they were missing a lot of resolution over the time period that they were interested in. Beyond that, um, you can see here in these labels, uh, some citations to papers, those papers, um, are plate models for each of these different plate systems. And what's really important to note here is that they're all produced using the same methodology. So even though today, most plate models for oceanic areas for the recent past, so 200 million years to present or so, most of them, if not all of them, rely very heavily on magnetic anomaly data, on fracture zone uh, traces, there are a number of ways that you can model that data to produce rotation poles and to generate reconstructions. So you can imagine that if I'm trying to make 
observations about changes in plate motion that happened over a pre pretty short period of time. So I need quite a, you know, I need good resolution. If I'm using plate models for these different systems, each of them and each of the plate models have been produced using a slightly different methodology. It's possible that there will be things that I'll be observing that are just artifacts of the fact that the models are produced in different ways. It's kind of measuring the speed of a car going down the road with three different uh, methods. Well, there will be differences, but does it mean that the car went at three different speeds the three times, or is it just your instrument? So we're going to be looking for mainly two things. So we're going to take these plate models that we're very confident in that we have quantified uncertainties for. So as far as plate models go, they're about as good as it gets, not because we've done them, but because of the methodology and, and the way that we can uh, constrain what the uncertainties are. So the way we can say how the models are wrong and, and why. And we're gonna be looking for the evidence that was put forward in support of plume push. So a short-lived increase in spreading rates in the India-Africa Ridge at about 65 million years ago, and at the same time, a slowdown the other side of Africa. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about other tectonic events because things got normally makes this talk a bit too long, um, but it, it's in the paper if any of you are interested and go grab the paper, you'll find a few other things in there. Um, so all of these things were attributed to plume push. And we're trying to find out whether that's reasonable to do or not. So as previously suggested, we do indeed see a very sharp divergence rate, rate spike, both between India and Antarctica and India and Africa. So in those two spreading centers, it's very short. And as soon as, like as fast as it came about, it disappears. Um, but it's also very obvious and it's, you know, it really, it's really staggering. I mean, it's a really strong speed up. The thing we see that other authors didn't see before is that we can also see spreading rate spikes everywhere else. So suddenly we don't just have an Indian plate that's accelerating or an Indian ridge that's, that's accelerating. Every single spreading ridge in the entire Indo-Atlantic circuit seems to be accelerating. And after this was published, um, I was doing some other work in the North Atlantic. So I thought, ah, I know, I'll have a quick look at spreading rates there because I might as well. And there is also a spreading rate spike in the North Atlantic. And Graham was looking in the Pacific and there is also a spreading rate spike in the Pacific. So how exactly do you explain that? Before the hypothesis was that this pulse is super fast spreading and the fact that it coincided in time with the reunion plume must mean they're linked and the plume push force is really overwhelming this circuit. But now we have all of the spreading ridges accelerating and we know that the earth is not expanding. So what does that mean? Does that mean that then every subduction zone is also accelerating at this time so that you're consuming as much cross as you're creating? And there really isn't any geodynamic process that we can think of that could explain these types of spikes, not just because of how strong they are, but also because of the fact that as quickly as they come, they disappear and they don't seem to leave any sort of noticeable, they, they don't leave anything behind. They come, they go, nothing happened. So actually the simplest explanation is that the time scale might be slightly wrong. So we're doing all this work on the basis of magnetic anomalies, <clears throat> excuse me. And we assign dates to our magnetic anomalies using the geological time scale. So if the times we're assigning to the edges of these crons are slightly wrong, then we would end up with artifacts when we're plotting velocities. And it's really the simplest explanation and to our in our um, opinion is the only explanation because there are no other geodynamic processes that could explain these types of behaviors. And a timescale error explains it very, very simply. All you need to do is make this period of time a little bit longer and those speeds will come right down. And if you do that, if you remove these um, spikes, um, which we did 
coarsely. It wasn't that sort of the main goal of the paper was not to revise the timescale. That's a project on its own and it's quite a big one. Um, but if you just remove these or just like kind of try to ignore them and look at the trends over a longer period of time, Yes, they anti-correlate, which was suggested, right? Because we had this sort of acceleration in the Indian side, deceleration in the South, uh, South Atlantic side. But they do so over a very long period of time. There's no reason why you would relate this to the plume. And instead, you can simply explain it in, in terms of gradual changes. And plate tectonics in some ways can be quite boring and quite predictable. Most change tends to be gradual. And in this case, you can explain it with things like the Indian Ridge is becoming more mature, but on the Atlantic side, you have an already mature ridge, for example. The subduction zones in the northern part of India are changing. So these long-term uh, long trends are easy to explain without a plume. So again, we don't need a plume. We don't need a plume to explain the sudden accelerations, which just most likely are artifacts of a time scale miscalibration. And we don't need the plume to explain the long-term trends. So suddenly we have nothing left from the evidence that was supporting the birth of this plume push hypothesis. I wanted originally the paper to have the play on words, no room for the plume, which it never did. So I'm like now using it on talks. Um, I think it actually may have been Graham coming up with that, but at this point, I think I could probably take credit. Uh, anyway, so um, yeah, that's just a, a quick summary of what I've just said, that as of today, this evidence that has in the past been used to fuel more and more research suggesting that plumes have these superpowers, they can overwhelm entire plate circuits, um, kind of shown that that evidence might not be evidence at all. Yet, interestingly, we're still seeing publications, and I actually saw some research at EGU just a couple of weeks ago, of more research uh, presenting unexplained tectonic events in the vicinity of a plume and saying it must be the plume. But it seems to me like maybe it's time to move on and carry on trying to look into what actually drives the plates and not blaming things on the plume because as of today we have no evidence that they can introduce any significant changes into uh, torque balances. So that's the end of the research part. Um, Caitlin said that I could mention non-research things. They're not really non-research. Um, oh, before I do actually. So um, as I said, there is a, there are a few publications of this work. So the paper is only four pages long, but it's a bit the dancer. So it might be more of a Monday morning with a cup of coffee. Uh, we wrote about this for Geoscientist a few months ago, and that's more your sort of evening read maybe. Uh, so if you wanna read more about it, um, you can you can look for those. Um, so yeah, I was saying Caitlin uh, mentioned that I could talk about non-research things um, or yeah, non-science, non-research. They're non, not related to this research or to any other research, but they're related to geoscience. So I'm gonna do that for the next five minutes or so and mention a couple of initiatives that I'm involved in that might interest some of you. I hope they do. Um, the first one started like all good things with a tweet that I sent because um, I was quite upset uh, at one point where nature was announcing these article processing charges of like 9,000 dollars or pounds or whatever it was. And quickly after I saw Steve Hicks was tweeting about a diamond open access journal for seismology, and I thought, well, can, can we do something for tectonics? Like surely we could. And Dave was silly enough to reply and say, yeah, okay. Um, and this is more of the stage at which we are at now. Um, some of you may be aware of Volcanica, which is a free to publish and free to access diamond open access journal. Uh, it's been running since 2018, pretty successfully. And we've kind of taken the Volcanica model as inspiration and are working to launch Seismica Tectonica and Sedimentologica. Now, 
I'm only involved in Tectonica. When I shouted on Twitter, that's where I was going. I wanted something for tectonics and structural geology. Um, Seismica was kind of underway. We were kind of developing in parallel and then we noticed. And so we started talking. And then Sedimentologica is like the new kid on the block. They just jumped in and said, yeah, we want to do this as well. And the idea is pretty simple, is that um, you, as I'm sure you're aware, most publishing houses are just businesses and they are charging money to access science, they're charging money to publish science. And we shouldn't have to do that. We should be moving towards a publishing model that is free, not just for authors, but also for readers. So over this year, uh, we aim to launch at the beginning of 2022, we are working on these journals. I am, of course, going to try to recruit you for Tectonica. You can also um, go talk to the guys and others, of course. But the idea is that by 2022, we'll have three other diamond open access journals to join Volcanica. Down the line in the long term, the hope is that we can create some sort of umbrella organization to host all of these journals once we've proven that the model works which to an extent Volcanic is already proving it works. Um, and so we can really have a, a big volume of the annual outputs in geoscience be through these diamond open access um, publishing models. Uh, when I say we, I'm trying to recruit you, if you want to help us actually build a journal, then that would be great. Uh, you can commit as much time or as little time as you like. Uh, my life is taken over by it, but it's too late now for me. Um, I'm not necessarily saying we need editors because that's where people's minds jump to. I'm saying you might come in and help us test the website or test the review system or um, comment on our ongoing discussions about what should our author guidelines be like? What types of articles should we accept? What's our scope? So it's everything that goes into putting a journal together. So it's not just being a member of the editorial board, the committee, etc. You can also uh, comment to do that, but um, think bigger than that. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention really quickly that you may have already seen that QR code, I hope should work if you use your phone, is Black in Geoscience. So I was an editor of the EGU Geodynamics blog for about two years. I'm kind of winding down now, partly because of Tectonica taking my time. Um, and uh, last year, we did a blog post where we highlighted a number of Black geoscientists. And to be completely honest, we it was the night before the blog was going out. We had no banner image. And I thought, well, I've been a freelance illustrator for quite a long time now, a bit over a decade. Um, I'll put something together. And to my surprise, people really loved this uh, raised fist logo. So ended up going to March and it's raised something like $20,000 uh, in the last 10 months or so. And I don't know if any of you all have one of these pins. Uh, if you don't, you'll be very jealous and I don't have more, so I can't even give them out. But we also did these little pins um, and that raised something like two, no, sorry, 2,000 each. So like 4,000 um, pounds, everything went to, in entire racism charity. So it was really amazing to see, but I just wanted to point you to it here. If you wanna buy some of the merch, I really look forward to the day that we go back to a in-person conference and a hundred people turn up in the same t-shirt. I think it'll be pretty cool. So yeah, that's that's it. I'll stop talking now. Um, so half an hour, I said it was going to be short. That's, that's great. Thanks ever so much, uh, uh, Lithia. So covered a few different things there as well. So um, I, th I think, can we start with questions maybe for your for your uh, more kind of scientific uh, presentation too? Does anybody have any questions for Lithia? Yeah, I've got a question before I get started. Yeah, hang on, turn my video on. Hey, Lithia, how are you? Hey, how are you? All right, all right. Um, so that that um, the timescale thing, and why what exactly has changed? Has the Maastrichtian got a bit shorter, or or is it something else? Well, nothing's changed yet. Um, so the 
my idea, I should say, because uh, I don't know if my co-authors um, agree here, but when we did this work, we only did sort of back of the envelope calculations as to over the period where we see this spike, over the length of that period, how much would we have to change it? How much would we have to change the edges of that period in time to, to make those spikes disappear? But we didn't actually went on and carried out a proper correction um, to the time scale. That's what I'm really trying to push myself to do now in the evenings outside of work, which is a going medium. Um, but part of it at the moment is figuring out if the time scale, as amazing uh, an achievement as it is for earth science, it's in reality is a lot of spliced mini time scale. There's lots of steps to producing a time scale. So for me at the moment, it's kind of trying to figure out what is the likely step where things may have gone wrong? Because say places where we have radiometric dating, well, probably those are roughly about right uh, or it's more likely to be right. But maybe if, um, I don't know, we've spliced two time scales in, in a certain point and they're both calibrated using different methods, then maybe that splice is where things have gone wrong. So um, yeah, it's work in progress. So how, how big does the change need to be? And I mean, how much if it were the if it were the biggie, the KP boundary, for example, I mean, it's probably not right. But if it were, how much would it need to move by, do you think? Well, according to the and take it with a pinch of salt, because, again, it's sort of very rough calculations. But we were looking at sort of one point eight million years, I think, at the top oh, of my okay. head. OK, so which it might not seem like a lot, but it's it, in terms of the time scale, it's significant. Mm. Um, so it's. Yeah. It's again, it's an ongoing project. And um, I just, the thing that I'm, that makes me feel quite positive about it is that I'm very confident that what we're seeing and all these spikes that we're seeing, not just in the Indian Atlantic circuit, but everywhere else. And of course there are observations made from models, but I'm very confident that those models are very well constrained. So you can't just simply say, oh, it's a model, it's probably the model is wrong. But actually, we have very high confidence in the observations that we're making. So hopefully we can kind of fight our corner and do that correction or at least suggest that correction um, to the time scale and find, find a way that it works. I mean, I think the thing is elements of the time scale are a model also, of course, aren't they? Mm. More than others. But, but um, yeah. if you compare different published time scales, I think many of the boundaries have at least a couple of million years difference between different published versions on them and they frequently change from one iteration to the next over that kind of magnitude so I mean I, I wouldn't be particularly surprised you know I, I just wonder what other knock-on effects there might be for mm. you know a, 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 other things like um extinctions spring to mind for example and they're, they're you know well anyway it'll be interesting yeah. to see what you come up with about exactly where that difference might sit yeah it, this was a, we set out to show whether or not plume push is a valid hypothesis and we've ended up with the plume push community going a bit angry that we took a toy away from from explaining some of these things and then you know now with the time scale trying not to upset the time scale community by seeming to suggest that they did a poor job is is not but it's yeah it's just uh, well plume people have always been like this it's always been a magic explanation for lots of things so i think it's good that you challenge it i've always found it very annoying anyway that was a great talk thank you great. thanks so, good, good to see you so um, there's, there's, there's one uh, question in the chat from Pablo. I don't know if Pablo is about to, to ask that. If not, I can, I can do that. And John might have something, John Wheeler might have something to add to it. And then after that, we'll move to Andy uh, Biggin, who also has a question for, for Lucia as well, I think. So uh, Pablo, are you there? Hi, Dan. Uh, thank you, Lucia. Uh, great talk. It's a very simple question. Um, it seems that you challenge this uh, data as an artifact. Obviously, it has a, a lot of reasons to be that way. But it, I, I thought that you mentioned that there were other examples. Is it any other example of accelerations that deserves to be challenged as well? Or is it uh, just simply this is the only and the biggest example of a play acceleration? It's the only example that has been used to suggest that plumes are to blame. 
So like, if you look at the whole plume push hypothesis, it's based on this one example. And other things that you can see, so other events that have since been, uh, again, justified in terms of a plume, it's been following from this. So I don't want to say they're biased, but I think that, you know, if you're looking at a tectonic event that you can't explain and you have a precedent where somebody else has seen something similar and said it's a plume, you're more likely to, to, to jump to that. Um, mm. So we, we can feel that by looking at the original, if you like, example and saying, well, it's not the case that we're kind of you know, already covering it. Um, that's, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I guess we have this very smooth picture of everything and it does make you wonder uh, just what acceleration is possible uh, <laughs> in nature over shorter time scales mm. than, than we can actually look at. Jo John yeah. Wheeler, did you did you have any comment on this too? You said uh, you, you, you made a cryptic uh, comment in the, in the chat. Yeah, I'm just flagging uh, my interest. Um, so I guess actually I have two. Um, so one of them is uh whether when you said that you kind of implied you were uncomfortable with the idea of subduction speeding up and i can see the geometric argument it's it, it's an obvious geometric consequence um but then i was thinking um um what independent evidence do we have for subduction rates around that time i don't know i have another question but maybe i'll just stop there and ask that one do you mean, it's, I'm not sure I understand. Um, do you mean, because I said that if everything, uh, if every spreading ridge is accelerating, therefore subduction must be accelerating? Well, that is what you said, and that makes perfect sense. But then I think you said you were uncomfortable with that. Kind of well, no, so, um, so there's two, there's two, let's say, if, if every spreading ridge is accelerating, um, either the earth is expanding because you're creating all, all of this extra oceanic lithosphere, right? Or um, subduction is also accelerating, therefore the earth is staying the same size and, and subduction is accelerating. The reason why I'm skeptical of it is not, is not that I think we fully understand the rates at which slabs sink uh, or anything like that. It's simply that it's such a short lived change that's what makes me skeptical. And that's what makes me think that there isn't a geodynamic process behind it. And it's more likely to be an artifact. It's because it's so, so short lived. It's a, such a short pulse. That's why I'm skeptical. Oh, okay. Um, can I just ask another one, Dan? Yeah. Um, so, oh, John. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, I mean, maybe you've kind of half answered this already, but could you actually explain what plume push is and um, because when I was thinking about it I thought actually there could be one, more than one way of interpreting that phrase um, and also um, has anyone done an order of magnitude uh, calculation on it because that for me would be something that would be useful to have in the in the discussion. Yeah so um, that's a very good question so plume push in the way that it's proposed in this hypothesis is a gravitational force. So essentially you have a plume that reaches the base of the lithosphere causes doming and that doming leads to gravitational forces away from the head of the plume. Um, people have tried in numerical models to put a magnitude to it. The problem that they have, even if they don't want to admit it, is a problem of circularity. Because when they are modeling the arrival of a plume and the kind of forces that that may lead to, they are using constraints extracted from plate models. So if you're producing a numerical model that is constrained from observations taken from plate models, and those plate models in the first place are showing you things like plate accelerations on the basis of the arrival of a plume, you're kind of going around in a circle. You're basing a model on a model and you're trying to test something that the first model assumes is true. If you see what I mean, it's kind of hard to explain, but there's like, there is a loop there that is very hard to get out of. So I think it would be really interesting for somebody to try to quantify the, the magnitudes for sure. And to what extent can they change plate motion or not? Or, you know, probably they're just a very small part of the 
you know, if you consider them um, in between all the other plate forces. But I don't think there is the study out there that has done this in a way that I found particularly robust. I always find that they're likely to be biased by their um, starting assumptions. Oh, I see. So I'm just thinking out loud for, a, for one more minute maximum. Um, I mean, ridge push, it comes from the topography of the ridge, doesn't it? So, yeah. so I was about to say, therefore, all you need, surely something that you need anyway, is the topography to do with the reunion plume. Uh, but then I realized, well, hang on a minute, we, 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 that was a long time ago, and it probably isn't very easy to estimate what the topography was. So, um, yeah. Do you, do you see the direction I'm coming from there? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I do. Um, mm. But yeah, I, it's like a lot of things in geodynamics, actually, it's just the problem of quantifying the magnitudes is that often you're producing, say, a numerical model and you're basing or you're constraining it and you're making assumptions that don't come from direct observation, but that come from other models. So you can't get yourself tied in all kinds of knots there. And it's, it's hard to say whether your outputs are really um, trustworthy, for lack of a better word. Um, Thank you. Can I just ask a related question? Dan, is that all right? So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, it, is this essentially that that it's difficult to calculate dynamic topography issue then? Because I mean, it is right as I understand. Yeah. It's actually, really difficult to understand how convection in the mantle causes surface uplift or subsidence. Mm. You know, base lithosphere. Is it is it essentially the same thing, and that's just hard to calculate? Yeah, to my understanding, yeah. And I'm not. I'm no expert in 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 that i'm no expert in dynamic topography or in you know numerical modeling of mantle dynamics but yes that's that's uh, pretty much it mm. i mean it, it uh, yeah well it it is but i've always been surprised that it is i've never really understood why it's so difficult but yeah apparently so mind you i've never really tried myself i got some yes <laughs> the, and they there you go yeah and they seem confident about it so anyway now it's really interesting Okay, so um, Andy, do you still have a question? I do, yeah. Um, hi, Lucy, a nice talk. Um, and great work on the Diamond Open Access uh, Journal as well. Thanks. Uh, a really great idea. Um, yeah, so it's kind of related to all this. Um, so India is still colliding with Asia, and the Tethyan slab has snapped off, right, as... as uh, it seems to be what the, the seismology suggests. Um, so there's a paper that I managed to, to dig out from about 10 years ago, it might have been superseded, I don't know, but where they said that, you know, essentially you can't explain then that ongoing collision and uplift of, of the Himalayas without a dynamic um, upward um, driving force coming, you know, from the base of the mantle essentially, if not plume, but, you know, kind of super plume type, um, uh, yeah, buoyancy. So, um, yeah, I wondered if you, you know, isn't that sort of an independent kind of argument for, um, you know, just bottom up driving of, of plates in this, in this region? I'm not familiar enough um exactly with what you mentioned to really comment but um because actually the the india there's lots of open questions about the closure of the tethers the exact geometry of subduction zones the changes through time whether between india and eurasia we had two parallel subduction zones or we had just one or we had an ocean in between india and the con the eurasia or we had uh island arcs in there so I think because we have so many questions it would be very difficult to use this area as a testing ground for this type of hypothesis mm -hmm. ideally what you'd want to find is another instance in time where you have a different completely different uh, part of the world different plume different spreading center and then look at that but there isn't one 
because you'd need something fairly recent. You'd need uh, sort of the 200 million years, at the, like the oldest end, because you need oceanic data to really produce plate models that are confident enough to make these kinds of uh, study, to do these kinds of studies. So yeah, I'm not sure you could say a lot on the basis of that Pathian region, just because of how much debate is still ongoing as to its history and its evolution. But as I said, not, not an expert. I incidentally ended up in the Indian Ocean, but. Um, sure. Yeah, so this, this paper is by Becker and uh, Fachena, the 2011 okay. EPSL. Um, yeah, so with your spreading ridges, you, um, I, I didn't study it in detail, but you, you weren't looking in the Pacific. Uh, I guess you're assuming that there's, um, yeah, that, that they, you know, could it not be accommodated by, you know, the whole Pacific hemisphere? Well, I went looking in the, I don't know if I understand. I'm, I went looking, Graham went looking in the Pacific. I went looking in the North Atlantic. We went looking at the point that we realized that we could see spreading rate spikes everywhere. Mm. And we started uh, discussing the idea that maybe it's a time scale error. If what is wrong is the time scale, then you should be able to see a spike everywhere. Because if what's wrong is the time scale, if what's wrong is the dating of magnetic crumbs, then you should see it in any ocean that you look at. That's why we looked in those other oceans. There is no reason why in these other oceans that are so far from a plume, you would see any sort of plume effect. So that's precisely why we went looking in them. Because if we see a spreading spike in these oceans, then it's definitely not the plume, it's way too far. So then it kind of strengthens our hypothesis that it's just a time scale artifact. Yeah, I, sp I suppose I'm, I'm getting into, I'm touching on the murky world of super plumes here, right? You know, right. if you've got the, if you've got kind of hemispherical uplift in, in the Indo-Atlantic um, uh, hemisphere, then, you know, that, that's sort of competing with the Pacific super plume. And, you know, did the, did the Indo-Atlantic sort of take over at this time? You know, so it's kind of, I mean, that's drawing away from the specific example of the, of the reunion plume. But, you know, I'm just wondering if that's something that you'd, you'd kind of, uh, you'd looked into. Um, can I just jump back in on that one? Go ahead, John. Yeah. So this is a vague memory, um, but isn't there an argument? We're, we're talking about the late Cretaceous, are we? The yeah, we're talking about the sort of Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Oh, around right, there. yeah, because I was just I'm trying to join some dots here and probably haven't joined them. But isn't there a story that that the sea level was so high in the late Cretaceous? We've got lots of chalk in the late Cretaceous. So there was, I believe there was a global, whatever the technical word is, high stand or whatever. Anyway, sea level was high. Isn't it because there was meant to be a very large volume of mid-ocean ridge because there was a kind of global high rate of spreading. And so it was the sheer volume of mid-ocean ridge material that simply displaced the seawater onto the, onto the continents. Am I making that up? And is it relevant? It's, it's not that it's irrelevant, it's a, it's a whole different discussion uh, because um, like, it's just its own discussion. Um, the sort of conclusions of our work and the, 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 the main aim, which was to show whether a plume in the Indian Ocean was causing tectonic reorganizations, therefore strengthening the idea that plumes can um, affect how plates move is flawed and that's its own discussion there that is really mm. close and yeah, then yeah. what you're yeah. saying now is yeah it's just a, its own discussion i suppose but I i'm not i'm not familiar with the the paper you mentioned it, it, it's it's a memory um which might be imperfect um from a number of years ago but i, I just I, wondered that if we were stuck in the same if we were discussing the same time period it would be relevant because um you know it would be some very circuitous evidence for increased spreading rates at uh, that time. Pete, you, you so, so that that protect that high stand you're talking about, John, was pretty much at the Cenomanian Tyronean boundary. So at the, the mid Cretaceous, the boundary between uh, early and late. And actually after that, 
best estimates indicate that global sea level was falling through the uh, the late Cretaceous and then into the Paleogene. So, so I mean, it, you know, it, it it is a hypothesis that the ridge volume was increased, and that's one of the things that drove that late Cretaceous, mid Cretaceous high stand. But the timing would be a little bit wrong for this, I think. Okay. So uh, um, Betty put something in the chat as well. I just wonder whether she wanted to follow up on her comment with uh, regarding the Pacific Superplume. Hi, Lucia. Thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I teach a little bit about mantle dynamics. I'm not an expert, but I, I really enjoyed the topic. So, um, yeah, I was just kind of commenting on Andy's observations that uh, the Pacific Superplume might play a role globally, but... It was my understanding, at least from the little bit I've read, that actually um, it's still very debated what the Pacific superplume is in reality. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of asking for more comments of the, on this, if anyone has more comments. Mm -hmm. um, I, sorry, I agree, it's, it's, it's controversial. That's why I said murky world. <laughs> <laughs> I think plumes in general are um, controversial. Um, I, so the downside of doing this, this work is that now people seem to think I know about plumes. <laughs> I'm a plate modeler. I know about plates. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so, yeah, I can't comment very much on the Pacific. Pacific okay. one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, here comes speed. I was just, it just made me laugh, which year that you, you dislike plumes and now you're being actually at well, forward as an I don't expert. dislike them either. I don't have a personal relationship with them. Some people <laughs> seem to have a very strong I you know, plumes just came my way. I'm I was plate modeling quite happily and trying to figure out what moves plates and I ended up I'll be neutral about them. They are annoying. Come on. I, I just I accept your annoyance. So can I just ask a question as well, uh, Lucia? So, so given what you've just said, maybe this is slightly unfair, but, uh, um, you know, it, so if plume push is not a, a mechanism for, for um, you know, um, changing uh, plate rate movements, things like that, um, in your opinion, then, is, is, is the, the primary driving force for plate tectonics still slab pull then? I think most of our research over the last, what, five, ten years, seems to indicate that. And um, I think as mantle tomography improves, uh, which it keeps doing it very, very fast, I think hopefully we'll continue to find better ways to integrate observations from mantle tomography into plate modeling workflows so that we can start producing plate models that are not just consistent with surface observations, but consistent with also whatever we see in mantle tomography. Um, most research seems to point that way. I think the day that we crack plate driving forces, it will you know, be the next sort of big thing ticked off the list because again, then you could really make great plate models back into deep time, which at the moment is very hard because when you lose oceanic lithosphere, which is obviously a great source of information, suddenly you have very little to go on. So if you knew exactly you know, how fast uh, can plates move, what are the you know, the faster and the slower limits and why do they move in the way they do and what are the forces and how do the forces interact with each other, then you could use that as a sort of geodynamic rule book to produce plate models and you wouldn't need to worry as much about having surface data. You could use that surface data to then test them or verify them. And so it would really change the way we do plate modeling. So, um, yeah. Okay, um, so we are running slightly short on time now. Um, so I, I think uh, if anybody has any uh, comments or questions about uh, Tectonica or uh, Black and Geoscience, I think we, we can perhaps leave that to uh, GatherTown. And Caitlin has put a link uh, in the chat for, for GatherTown. Uh, but um, yeah, I'd just like to end, I think, by uh, a big thanks to Luthia for, for her uh, talk today. It was uh, really thought provoking and it was nice to have actually a bit of uh, discussion at the end there. You certainly fired up all of uh, my colleagues, I think, into, <laughs> into asking some uh, 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 good questions and, and contributing towards the discussion. So um, 
so many thanks again and so a virtual clap for <laughs> uh, Lucia thanks. that's uh, it was it was a great talk and if everyone is able to uh, join in gather town uh, afterwards then uh, please use the link in in the chat as i mentioned before so thanks again Lucia.